It's a stark conclusion James Risen has come to in the decade plus since September 11th. The veteran New York Times investigative journalist is best known for the explosive revelation that the Bush administration ordered the National Security Agency to eavesdrop on Americans without warrants after 9-11. But now he has compiled examples of what he sees as that hunt for cash, greed for power, and lives wrecked in his new book, Pay Any Price. In, in another chapter, Jim Rison, you, you write about millions of dollars spent on programs that were completely fraudulent. Uh, one was run by a man named Dennis Montgomery. He had worked in uh, uh, computer software, but he was a gambler. Right. And uh, he sold the CIA and the Pentagon on technology that turned out to be not at all what he said it was. Right. There was a, it's, it's difficult to tell in some of these cases who's scamming who. Montgomery was, in his attorney's words, a con man. He and his partners eventually procured more than $20 million in government contracts. One program had officials at the CIA convinced that Montgomery could uncover plans for the next al-Qaeda attack. If you talk to Montgomery, he argues that the CIA wanted him to do what he was doing. In this case, they began to believe in this kind of war fever that you could find uh, al-Qaeda messages hidden in Al Jazeera broadcasts. The Middle East broadcaster was at the time al-Qaeda's chosen outlet for broadcasting messages from Osama bin Laden. Montgomery convinced intelligence officials that his software could decode orders from the terror group to its operatives. So-called intelligence from his program about a new wave of airliner attacks was eventually delivered directly to President George W. Bush in December 2003 and led Mr. Bush to issue an extraordinary order. This high, highly secret program was used by the Bush administration to ground planes all over uh, Europe and the United States. When actually there was nothing to it. Right, it was, it right. Was a, it was a hoax. Right. It's this very complicated story about a man recognizing an opportunity who had never been involved in national security before, and the CIA and the military all just hungry for whoever could come with the latest idea. Investigative reporter Aram Rostin revealed in a recent edition of Playboy magazine that a con man fooled CIA spies into grounding international flights by selling them fake technology which was supposed to decode al-Qaeda messages hidden in TV broadcasts. In 2003, Dennis Montgomery was chief technology officer at Etrepid Technologies. According to the report, Montgomery convinced the CIA that he had software that could detect and decrypt barcodes in broadcast by Al Jazeera, the Qatari news station. The agency was apparently impressed enough to set up its own secure room at the firm to do what Montgomery called noise filtering. He somehow produced reams of data consisting of geographic coordinates and flight numbers. Rostin says in December 2003, CIA Director George Tenet was sufficiently sold on Montgomery's data to ground transatlantic flights, deploy heavily armed police on the streets of Manhattan, and evacuate 5,000 people from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge told the press the terror alert was the result of, quote, credible sources about near-term attacks that could either rival or exceed what we experienced on September 11th. In fact, according to evidence from his former lawyer, Montgomery, the so-called credible source, was, quote, a habitual liar engaged in fraud. Montgomery worked with the CIA's Directorate of Science and Technology, engaged in exotic research and intelligence gathering. According to Playboy, eventually a branch of French intelligence helped the CIA prove that the so-called Al Jazeera messages never existed. Files were handed over to counterintelligence to investigate the scam. Frances Townsend, a Homeland Security advisor to Bush, said she did not regret having relied on Montgomery's mysterious intelligence, saying, quote, It didn't seem beyond the realm of possibility. We were relying on technical people to tell us whether or not it was feasible.
As we turn now to a story that reveals the real source behind the Bush administration's decision to raise the terror alert level to orange, it was December 2003. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge warned of, quote, near-term attacks that could either rival or exceed what we experienced on September 11th. He claimed the information came from credible sources. The source was a man who convinced the Bush White House, the CIA, the Navy, Special Forces Command, the Air Force, and the Senate Intelligence Committee that the TV network Al Jazeera was transmitting secret messages to Al Qaeda sleepers. Dennis Montgomery operated a small software company out of Nevada. He said he could predict terrorist attacks by decrypting secret barcodes hidden in Al Jazeera's broadcast. The Bush administration relied on Montgomery for years to determine when to increase the terror threat level. One of the most bizarre intelligence operations I've ever heard of, a man who was not necessarily a scientist, but he was a self-proclaimed scientist and a self-proclaimed uh, inventor. He claimed he'd found these secret messages. He, he basically, he claimed he decoded al-Qaeda's secret communications to sleeper terrorists around the world. And he was doing this in his warehouse in Nevada on his computer. Um, people in the uh, administration took him seriously, and people in the intelligence services took him seriously. Not everybody. Some people thought this was complete nonsense, because it was. But enough people took him seriously that it had immense effects on people across the world and, and in America. Well, first of all, uh, let's go to that moment when the terror alert was raised. It was almost exactly six years ago, right? December 21st, 2003, raised to orange. Why? The uh, this fellow, Dennis Montgomery. And who is he? He is a self-proclaimed scientist. He doesn't have much of a scientific uh, uh, education. He, he had a two-year degree uh, in medical technology, and he was an inventor and a self-proclaimed uh, computer programmer. I don't know how many how much skills he has in, as a software programmer, but he he said that in Al Jazeera he was finding these hidden numbers shaped as barcodes. Who was he telling this to? He had access to intelli the intelligence services, to a division within the CIA called Science and Technology, and he had that through through political contacts that his, his financier had. And his financier was? His financier was a former aide of the former right-hand man to Michael Milken, the, the disgraced junk bond king, of all things. From many years ago. Yeah. He went to prison. The, uh, Michael Milken went to prison. Now, the, the, the fellow who was financing um, Dennis Montgomery, Warren Trapp, he never went to prison. His SEC went after him, but never successfully. And how did he get these contracts? And what exactly did he say? I mean, explain what you're saying, uh, because, I mean, this is not just the— uh, crazy fantasizing of one guy. You have Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, talking about, you know, Al Jazeera being a terrorist network. That's very true. Um, so people were—people saw Al Jazeera in this light, this negative light. The administration did already, perhaps. But what he was saying is it had no—it no, didn't matter what the content was. He was saying in the electronic feed from Al Jazeera, there was little secret bits of information injected in it technologically, just little technological—little bits and, and so forth. Perhaps the pixels were rearranged, and, and he was able to decode it all. He was able to decode it all and translate it into numbers. Those numbers, he said, were latitudes and longitudes. In other words, it was a stream of video, and he was finding these latitudes and longitudes, times, flight numbers, and he would just churn that out. As he would call it, this is my output. This is the Al Jazeera output. And he had figured out a way that somehow Al Jazeera was Al Qaeda's method of transmitting this data secretly. It, what, what it would have required, of course, is all these terrorists around the world to have some sort of decoding equipment that could have unscrambled it, which was— And I these think, longitudes and latitudes were supposedly of attacks? Yeah. Sometimes it wasn't even a, a latitude and longitude. Sometimes it was just a latitude, just one number. And he was like, it's somewhere around here, and he would just work and say, it's, it's here. And then, you know, it was—you'd have— scares like uh, Tappahannock, Virginia was one place, a little town in Virginia, or, or you know, somewhere in Seattle, or Galveston, Texas, near the, near the fuel tanks, and, and they, would, they would react. And they would cancel planes, for example, around the holidays, like the French Airlines, yeah, Air that France. Was, exactly. That was one 
a particular period when they took him, for some reason he was taken very seriously, it was during that orange alert, and he was the source for all those numbers that were, those, those flights that were, he was the reason those flights were canceled. Nobody, most people in the administration didn't even know where it was coming from. The only a, a tiny group knew of Dennis Montgomery, a very tiny group, perhaps a handful of people at the CIA. A slightly bigger group knew about this crazy Al Jazeera bit. They knew the substance of what he was saying. But that part got to the Bush White House, it got to the Homeland Security, and it, it made its way to the, the administration. And by the way, it's all still classified. Even though they all know it's false, it's still classified. And how much money did he get? Uh, no one knows for sure. It looks like his companies over the years have received uh, 30 to 40 million dollars, 30 to 40 million dollars. From the U.S. government? Yeah. His company called Etrepid. The first company was Etrepid. More recently, he operated through a, cup, a couple of others. His first financier, as I mentioned, was this man Warren Shrepp, Michael Milken's former aide. The next financier was a woman named Idra Blixith, a, a billionaire, um, and she ended up funding him uh, as well. And uh, they had a company called Blixware, offering the same product to the U.S. government, the same mysterious technology. Now, uh, you interviewed the um, former Homeland Security. Security advisor Francis Townsend to explain what she said. I reached her. She said it was classified. She was very. Uh, she was not willing to talk much about it in detail, but she confirmed this was. Uh, she knew about it. She remembered it distinctly. She had chaired the meetings, the daily meetings, uh, to address the threats that came from this secret Al Jazeera decoding. And she said it had been eventually deemed uncredible. Oh. She, her point, by the way, if I could, was that they had to take it seriously at the time. After all, they say the CIA was telling it to them. You know, they, they, it sort of was. They would have been, you know, they would have been irresponsible had they not, in some way, acted on it. So when did they figure out there was something wrong? Some people knew immediately there was something wrong. I mean, most sensible people in the government, anybody who heard it, knew it was uh, not the case. Uh, I quote some people in the article, uh, former CIA officials. They were livid. They were just—there was almost a battle in these, in these meetings where people who had street experience, field experience as, as officers were just livid. They knew this was impossible and stupid. But other people insisted they had to act on it, and, and it was, they were protecting these, their, their source. One CIA guy said, give me the algorithms. I want to see. I want to reproduce what this guy is finding. That was the issue. He wouldn't ever give—and since then, he still hasn't—he wouldn't give uh, explain to anybody how he was doing this mysterious decoding. So go from what the CIA was paying to um, uh, the U.S. government to French intelligence and where they came into this. Well, the reason they came in is because, if you'll remember, they were canceling British flights, they were canceling Mexican flights, and they were canceling French flights, among others. The French were impacted. Air France flights, uh, Air France, I think it was uh, Flight 68 and Flight 70, they were, were canceled repeatedly. Eventually, the agency had to tell the French. I mean, it was, of course, bizarre to, to keep on canceling some services, I mean, some, some plane flights and never say why, just saying, this is chatter, it's great intelligence. So finally, they had to say it. And of course, uh, I, as I understand it, I think there was a little bit of embarrassment as, as people were, relay, were relaying the information. But they eventually worked out a system, and I don't have the details. They protect this type of information very carefully. They're liaison relationships, they say. Eventually, they, they try to recreate. They, they, they commissioned the best firm they could find to see if there was anything to it, and, and they produced a very detailed report, apparently, and just said there was, there was no way this was possible. And even as he'd get thrown out of one agency, he'd go to another, as if no. there was no communication between U.S. government agencies, giving him millions of dollars. That's what's intriguing. It really is. And he was selling, if I could, not just this technology, but other technology. He had, he had systems uh, he was selling to the Air Force and the U.S. Special Operations Command, where he claimed Predator video was coming. He could run it through his, his computer and immediately recognize a face of, say, Zarqawi or somebody else, or re immediately recognize everybody who was carrying an AK-47. And his computer software could do that in real time. Um, which, uh, you know, couldn't happen. And then he also claimed his software could detect submarines under the water um, if, they, if they were given a big picture of the ocean, things like this. And you even uh, interview someone who says he called me on his cell phone and said, hit this button to create a box around a video of a weapon as soon as I tell you to. Yeah, former employees, they, they told this to the FBI, and they told it to me, too. They, they uh, uh, sort of described this very elaborate charade where he would 
he would have these visitors from the federal government. He would try to show them how this soft, his software— He would do demonstrations. He would do demonstrations. Here's how my software will detect a, a bazooka. It would be like a toy fake bazooka. And, uh, you know, the idea was my software can detect anything you wanted to detect. And But they said, you know, in fact, what was happening was when this bazooka showed up on the screen, they were hitting a button, and that would— create a little circle around the bazooka. Uh, and he was claiming that his computer was recognizing the bazooka, which would be obviously valuable technology if, if that was the case. Now, Aaron Rostin, you say that uh, Montgomery got a contract with the Pentagon as late as January of this year, of 2009. Yes, January 2009. Um, there's um, it, It's indisputable that he got a contract for $3 million. Um, the contract I have, the copy I have, is heavily redacted, but it's clear the Al Jazeera stuff was part of it. This Al Jazeera, uh, you know, encryption method and that technology was part of this. They were paid, uh, his company was paid uh, $2.5 million, it appears, uh, on that contract by the, US, by the U.S. government. This year? This year. On Al Jazeera? Um, uh, this whole Al Jazeera technology. This, uh, they were. He was. He. His company was paid, and he was paid. He received money too. And it, it had to do. It's unclear exactly what it was for, but it seemed to have to do with that Al Jazeera stuff that has been. It's been knocked down. And it's obviously preposterous, and it has been. It had was knocked down six years ago by the CIA. Back during the Bush administration, officials like Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld often accused Al Jazeera of serving as al-Qaeda's favorite TV station. That may explain how a man named Dennis Montgomery convinced the CIA that Al Jazeera was sending coded messages through its broadcast signal to al-Qaeda operatives. And Montgomery claimed he had the computer software to break the code. For several months, starting in the fall of 2003, Montgomery's analysis led directly to national code orange security alerts and canceled flights. The only problem... He was making it all up. And you and me, the taxpayers, well, we paid for it. The story is told in the new issue of Playboy magazine, and the author, Aram Rostin, joins me from our New York bureau. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Guy. Let's start at the beginning. What was Dennis Montgomery claiming he could find in Al Jazeera's broadcasts? First of all, let me point out, it was all class it's still all classified. Um, that said, what he was claiming to find were barcodes, in essence, sequences of information that he said then revealed the targets of intended terrorist attacks. Barcodes from a television signal. Yeah, he said they were sort of embedded within the digital feed from Al Jazeera. Mm. So, and which is potentially technically possible, of course. You could sort of scramble the pixels in various ways. But he said he could decode all this and find these barcodes and or sort of things like barcodes, and he said these translate into coordinates, latitudes, longitude, times, flight times, flight numbers, and those were terrorist targets, he, he claimed. Well, let's back up for a moment. How did Dennis Montgomery convince the CIA to give him business? Because they gave him business. I mean, they actually put some money into this. He was in business with another man, as the article describes, in a company called Etrepid. They were the initial contractor. Although later he would sell this same, or try to sell this same software through another company with another partner. The first partner was a man named Warren Trepp. Now, people who are familiar with Michael Milken and the big um, scandal of the 80s, the Drexel Burnham scandal, the junk so bonds. Forth, the junk bond scandals, exactly, they'll be familiar with Warren Trepp because he was Michael Milken's right hand man mm. in the junk bond schemes. And he was running this company that hired. Dennis Montgomery, and that company managed to get the contract with the CIA. Exactly. You write about some of the Code Orange security alerts uh, that came directly from Montgomery's so-called analysis of those Al Jazeera signals. Uh, describe some of them. On the 21st of December, 2003, there was this huge announcement. It was a Sunday. Everything seemed to be going fine um, that Christmas season. And then suddenly on that Sunday, Tom Ridge, the Secretary of Homeland Security, made this announcement we're going to orange alert. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew what it was. Reporters, you know, investigative reporters and, and, and people who cover the intelligence community and so forth were, were all trying to gauge what was going on. They talked about, was there chatter intercepts and uh, informants and so forth? What it was, was these this, this guy's inter analysis or supposed analysis of Al Jazeera. 
And people in the CIA, people who knew what they were talking about, were furious. I, I, every quote I got from them was basically full of expletives. They were so upset. They were just losing it. But because, who believed him? I mean, who believed him there? What happened was there was a particular division um, called Science and Technology, and they're the, the CIA's, you know, sort of high-tech group, the, the ones that you often like in the movies. They mm. make disguises and intercepts and special little gadgets. They were the ones that believed it. They were the ones that gave him the contract. And some of this data reached uh, Francis Townsend, who was uh, President George W. Bush's senior counterterrorism advisor. Yeah, she. Well, what did it What happened was sources told me she was chairing the meetings uh, during this time that resulted from th this stream of supposed intelligence. She was the one who, who President Bush uh, appointed to oversee the, the, the response meetings, and she would hold them every day. And so I talked to her, and she she did admit she held those meetings. She she agreed she held those meetings. She she remembered all the intelligence. She sort of laughed about it. She said, "Well, they had to take it seriously." Is it possible that the decision to announce a code orange alert in December of 2003 was based on on additional intelligence, but not just this information from Dennis Montgomery? That's what uh, some of them have said. They say this was part of it, but not all of it. There were other concerns. But ex-CIA guys I talked to say that's not the case. They say this was it. How long did it take? before the CIA found out the truth about Montgomery. Some of them knew the truth about it all from, from the beginning, but eventually what they did is parts of the CIA tried to recreate this. It was hard because nobody was being told exactly what it was, which was one of the secrets to its success, if you want to call it that. Mm. If you can never figure out what intelligence is, how do you knock it down? They did it with the cooperation of the French intelligence services, I was told. Um, the French were affected tremendously because it was this Air France flight. It was, it was canceled over and over and over again. Nobody was telling them why anybody was canceling their flights. Eventually, the agency did tell them, and that's when this all came. Uh, they did some real analysis and found, you know, this isn't there. This was just irrational. So what happened? Did the CIA just sort of drop all contacts with Montgomery, or did they launch an investigation? Well, that's very complex. He was under a federal investigation in 2006. Hmm. So many agencies have touched on him, the FBI, the U.S. Air Force of Special Investigations, and others that and it's unclear where he stands legally and all that, but he's not in good shape right now legally. Um, Caesars uh, in Vegas, they filed criminal charges against him. Uh, this, the county attorney in, in Clark County, Nevada, filed criminal charges against him for bouncing checks to, to uh, Caesars Casino, almost a million dollars. Wow. He liked to gamble, in other words. Why do you think Dennis Montgomery was ultimately believed? I mean, was it was it the atmosphere of the times, uh, the sort of deep fear and concern that, that terrorists would strike again? Or was it pure carelessness by folks at the CIA and, and Homeland Security and other government agencies? It's always so hard. You know, I wrote a book about, about Ahmad Chalabi, and mm -hmm. it was sort of hard to figure out why he was believed so much. I think it's mainly because he offered an easy solution. If you go to somebody in government and say, listen, I've got a secret technology that can solve your terror problems right now and tell you exactly what al-Qaeda is thinking, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can't ignore that. That sounds great. That sounds perfect. That's what I think it was. This is a news conference with Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge, where earlier this afternoon he briefed reporters on the raising of the national threat level. Good afternoon. Today, the United States government raised the national threat level from an elevated to high risk of terrorist attack or is more commonly known from a yellow code to an orange code. We know from experience that the increased security that is implemented when we raise the threat level, along with increased vigilance, can help disrupt or deter terrorist attacks. The U.S. intelligence community has received a substantial increase in the volume of threat-related intelligence reports. These credible sources suggest the possibility of attacks against the homeland around the holiday season and beyond. The strategic indicators, including al-Qaeda's continued desire to carry out attacks against our homeland, are perhaps greater now than at any point since uh, September 11, uh, 2001. The information we have indicates that extremists abroad are anticipating near-term attacks that they believe will either rival or exceed the attacks that occurred in New York and the Pentagon and the fields of Pennsylvania 
nearly two years ago. Recent reporting reiterates, and this is a constant stream of reporting, that al-Qaeda continues to consider using uh, aircraft as a weapon. And they are constantly evaluating procedures, both in the United States and elsewhere, to find gaps in our security posture that could be exploited. Our actions, our considerable actions, are directed against their efforts. We have not raised the threat level in this country for six months, but I remind everyone we have raised it before. Homeland security professionals and security professionals at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, as well as the private sector, are hard at work to increase security in your community, state, and across the entire nation. Americans should know that along with this announcement comes action. A specific plan goes into place as we speak. Most importantly, we share specific information with those who need it and who can act upon it. Already I have spoken to the nation's governors, their homeland security advisors, several mayors, and other local officials, and asked them to review the security measures they currently have in place and to increase protections to thwart terrorist attacks. And they are doing so. In addition, we have made calls to officials from states and major cities and will continue to do so throughout the past week, reminding them to be on a heightened alert. And now we've called upon them to increase their levels of security. Leaders in the private sector that control resources critical to our country, they'll be contacted today and provided with very specific measures for them to take to protect those resources in the communities in which those resources are located. We're appropriate. We have also shared information with foreign countries to enlist their help in combating these terrorist threats. All federal departments and agencies are implementing action plans in response to the increase in the threat level. We have enhanced security at our nation's airports and around other transportation systems and infrastructure. We will redeploy agents and other resources at our borders to meet the current threat. There will be more Coast Guard air and sea patrols off our shores, in our ports, and escorting ships. Now, obviously, I will not outline all of the actions that are being taken to protect our citizens. Oh, we will not broadcast our plans to the terrorists. But extensive and considerable protections have been or soon will be in place all across the country. I can assure you that your government will stand at the ready 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to stop terrorism, during the holiday season and beyond. Now, in addition to knowing that Homeland Security professionals at all levels are working to keep our community safe, we do ask individual Americans to do a few additional things during this time of heightened alert. I've said many times before that Homeland Security begins at home. I guess it means I'm saying it again. Your awareness and vigilance can help tremendously. So please use your common sense and report suspicious packages, vehicles, or activities to local law enforcement. Go over your family emergency plans, and if you haven't developed one by now, please do so. These kinds of precautions, we think, just make good sense. I can tell all of you from personal experience that those of us who were affected for several days during the hurricane season were glad to have done some advanced planning to prepare. Detail some of the types of chatter that you're talking about when you're saying you're getting more information about threats during the holiday season. We continue to hear, uh, one, the interest in using uh, aircraft as a means of attack. Uh, two, there's continued discussion. Again, these are uh, from credible sources uh, about near-term attacks that could either rival or exceed what we experienced on September 11th. And I would say and reiterate that I think uh, not only the volume of reporting is up, uh, but from several credible sources. So we, we take a look at the scope of the reporting, the volume of the reporting, the credibility of the reports, and say now is the time uh, that we put into plan uh, 
uh, we put into action the plans that we've developed uh, during the past uh, several months. It's been six months since we put these plan plans into effect, and we just ramped them up again. The, Secretary Rich, saying the chatter is up. Uh, the highest has been since September 11th is a pretty dramatic statement. But how would you compare it to, say, the, the orange alert you called last February when there were CIA reports saying an imminent attack uh, was probably about to happen and obviously didn't? But how would you compare it to that time? Is the chatter more serious? Is it more intense? Well, I think the, the level, uh, again, I, I don't recall numerically, quantitatively that time. But, uh, any time the federal government goes uh, uh, from yellow to orange, orange back down to yellow, there's a consensus within the intelligence community that uh, not only the volume, but the credibility and the kind of reporting merits us to either raise or lower the level of threat. So I think it, it's, uh, it, it's more important to focus on the fact that there is that consensus uh, within the intelligence community that uh, we go up. Of in certain events, uh, such as Iman Ferris being arrested, that led to a, a, a sudden concern over the Brooklyn Bridge being blown up uh, or the wires being cut. Uh, has there been some specific event in terms of somebody being collared in uh, recent weeks? Has it been the boat that was intercepted uh, that had drugs and also several alleged Al Qaeda members? By the, by the Navy? Anything First of all, with regard to Iman Ferris, I think that highlights a very good point. I think he was, he was reported that it was he that said, gee, when, the, when, when America goes up and there's added security or an added level of, uh, uh, added levels of prevention, uh, we're inclined to deter or postpone those attacks, and that's one of the reasons we do go up. No, I think it is really the, uh, uh, the overall, uh, the, the credibility of sources pointing toward uh, near-term attacks in the United States, and it's really the scope and the volume of the reporting and the number of credible sources. What about the, the boat interception with the Al-Qaeda members? Do they provide any information that would have helped sort of go into the mix here? Well, you know, that, that's a uh, process of interrogation, and uh, if and when they do, and if it's actionable, we would uh, share it with the right kind of people but not discuss it publicly. Yes. With security already so high at the airports, mm -hmm. I mean, why is there continued concern about airplanes being used as weapons or bombs being put on them? I mean, I think Americans would think our airports are pretty secure right now. Mm -hmm. I hope they do because uh, we think America and uh, the aviation is uh, far, far more secure from uh, uh, the curbside to the cockpit. I mean, there are layered, comprehensive defensive measures, uh, baggage screeners. Uh, uh, a, a, which are now professional. We're armed hundreds. We're going to arm uh, thousands of pilots. We've got hardened cockpit doors. We've uh, got thousands of federal air marshals. But again, since there is a recurring theme that we've heard echoed again during the past uh, couple of uh, weeks as part of the reason that we go up, we have a substantial level of security at the airports, but we can ramp it up a little bit more when we go to Orange, and that's precisely what we do. But make no mistake about it, uh, aviation is far more secure than it's ever been in the history of the country. Yes. Are you also hearing more about uh, heightened problems for Americans abroad and are you giving any warnings there specifically? Well, I think the uh, uh, any intelligence relating to uh, activity or, or heightened threat to Americans abroad, as you know, is, is uh, those uh, those warnings are uh, issued from the state, state Department, and I'd refer you to the State Department uh, on those. There have been a couple that have been out there, obviously, and, and uh, whether or not based on the intelligence uh, that we are reporting on, that is, as it relates to threats to the homeland, you'd have to, I'd refer you to the State Department to see if they're going to add any additional uh, warnings to the international sector. Yes. Uh, you touched on this briefly, but what are the implications for people that are traveling over the holidays? Are they going to see different things at, at airports, at bus stations, et cetera? I think you will, they will uh, undoubtedly see uh, additional security at airports. Uh, we are going to ask uh, the traveling public uh, to do the same thing they did in helping us uh, as they did during Thanksgiving. We're not going to uh, compromise security. We are going to add more security, but if they do a couple of things during the course of their travel, it'll expedite things. I mean, take all those items out of your pocket and put them in that tray, take the computer out of the case, take the coat off. There are a lot of little things that they can do so we can move things along. But if you've got travel plans, travel. I mean, uh, we've had a lot of people working on uh, this for the past couple of days that uh, had some travel plans, and uh, we encourage them and everybody else. Just what about traveling to New York City? Sir? What about uh, 
what about traveling to New York City? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, obviously a city that's been hit well, before. Yeah. Are these threats directed at specific American cities, or is it just incredibly broad over the entire nation? Well, first of all, I think it has been reported before, and I think it comes as no surprise that uh, uh, New York and Washington have been, are, and undoubtedly always will be uh, some of the most high-profile uh, targets in this country. Uh, secondly, I think I've said before, I doubt if there's a city uh, that is better prepared, more on alert, or there's devoted more resources to uh, prevention uh, and security than New York City. And they probably have a lot of other mayors and police chiefs doing the same thing. So, no, this is uh, uh, not uh, specifically directed at New York. Uh, they are basically, they are always at a elevated state of uh, security and prevention. I mean, that's just how they, uh, their, their mayor uh, chooses to operate. And, you know, Chief Kelly, Mayor Bloomberg, Governor Pataki, uh, they've committed the resources to make sure the citizens and visitors are protected, and uh, they'll continue to do that. Sir. Mr. Secretary, is the reason why you're making this a national uh, you're raising the, the threat level nationally, is it because you don't have a specific or specifically targeted cities? You have, uh, again, just sort of chatter that's not really directed in any particular place. Yeah, we have uh, uh, reviewed, and again, it's not surprising that some of the same venues come up. I mean, they're always, they talk about New York and Washington, and it's predictable that uh, if they're looking for a if they're talking about a terrorist attack of the same or greater dimension than on 9-11, more, I mean, you naturally, I think, gravitate toward the larger urban areas. And so to make sure that uh, we enhance security across our major metropolitan areas, we go up. President Bush yes. has said in the past that the war on terror has greatly hampered al-Qaeda's ability to communicate within its network. What does it say that now you believe that the chatter is at a greater point than any time since 9-11? Uh, that in spite of the extraordinary success of the military and the CIA, uh, the cooperation with our allies, uh, the apprehension uh, or death of a lot of the principals and the freezing of the assets, this is still a international uh, war, international terrorist cells, including al-Qaeda, and uh, the fact that uh, uh, we are uh, picking up information that results in us going to orange, I think is a reflection of increased capacity probably on our side, not necessarily greater ability on theirs. Yes. With all the talk about going to Orange, was there ever any discussion? Was the level of chatter ever serious or high enough that you thought of going to Red? No, when we convened uh, those that we get together and have the discussion about uh, the quality of the information and the kinds of uh, uh, actions we should take, uh, whether or not we go up to Orange or whether we just go to more specific actions, no. I mean, but again, I think it's very important to note uh, that ever since 9-11, uh, uh, from the early morning hours when the president meets with uh, uh, the intelligence community and the attorney general and the FBI director and, uh, and everybody else, uh, there's been a continued focus, not only the war on terror abroad, but the war on terror has, and its impact in the United States twice a day uh, the intelligence community meets to review the intelligence of the day and how it relates to intelligence that they've acquired before. And so it's 24-7 since 9-11, and again, the convergence of uh, the, the quantity, the quality, and the credibility, and the scope, and the, and the notion that they're near-term attacks of uh, the scope that's equal to or greater than those that occurred on 9-11. There is a general uh, consensus within the community, now is the time to go up. We've got action plans, specific things people are going to do uh, at the federal, state, and local level. We'll give specific directions to uh, certain segments of the private sector. I mean, I just want Americans to understand that we, got a lot of, we have literally thousands and thousands of security, homeland security professionals out there who, based on going to Orange, will do addi additional things. There is an additional risk, and we are going to do additional things to combat the risk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all. Good evening. Armed guards will be traveling on some British flights starting this week to try to prevent terrorist attacks. The move has been under consideration by ministers for several months, 
The BBC was told tonight that the air marshals are being deployed in response to the heightened alert announced by the Americans a few days ago. The government is reviewing safety in response to heightened terrorist fears in the United States. Security levels there at their highest since September the 11th, two years ago. In a statement, the Home Secretary, David Blunkett, said, what we are proposing is a proportionate and appropriate level of response at a time when the threat to both our countries and around the world remains real and serious. The measures announced today apply only to British flights to and from the United States. Home Office sources have told the BBC tonight they expect the first of the armed Sky Marshals to be on board some aircraft within the next week. And earlier today, the Foreign Office updated its travel advice to Saudi Arabia, warning that terrorists could be in the final stages of preparing an attack there. It says travellers should only go to Saudi Arabia if it's essential. And topping our news, the nation's terror alert level has been raised to high. We check in with local airports to find out what that means for you if you're traveling. The alert is on orange or high level and airport officials say you may see more officers on patrol. The threat level was changed for the first time in six months yesterday. Code orange is the second highest level possible. This is Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Bob Edwards. The Department of Homeland Security yesterday raised the national terror alert to orange, the second highest level on the five-point scale. Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge said terrorists may be plotting attacks larger than those of September 11, 2001. The warning comes as millions of Americans prepare for holiday travel. NPR's Ari Shapiro reports. This is the first time in six months that the Department of Homeland Security has raised the threat level, and this may be a more serious orange alert than that of last spring. Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge said that there's been a substantial increase in threat-related intelligence reports. The information we have indicates that extremists abroad are anticipating near-term attacks that they believe will either rival or exceed the attacks that occurred in New York and the Pentagon and the fields of Pennsylvania. Though he didn't outline a specific plot, Ridge said that al-Qaeda may still use airplanes as weapons. A senior Homeland Security official said his department is particularly worried about flights originating overseas. The official said the Department of Homeland Security has been tracking an increase in chatter about holiday season threats against the U.S. for several weeks now. But, quote, in the past 48 hours, we've been able to verify the credibility of some of the sources. Randy Larson is CEO of the private group Homeland Security Associates. He takes this threat very seriously. I think there is more intelligence indications of a near-term attack. And I think when we use that term, he's probably talking 24 to 72 hours. I think that for them to go to orange alert for the entire nation during the holidays, they have some very credible information. But Larson believes recent security measures make it unlikely that terrorists would try to hijack commercial airplanes again. Their chances of getting caught are very, very high. And al-Qaeda typically does not like hard targets. They prefer the softer, easier targets. So. I would be very surprised if they attack commercial airliners. The orange alert triggers a number of safeguards at federal, state, and local levels. Airports will scrutinize passengers more closely, and the Coast Guard will add patrols, and border crossings will increase their security. George Forsman is the Deputy Assistant for Preparedness in Virginia. He says the ambiguity of this threat makes preparation more difficult. If any of us had crystal balls and could could look into the future and know, one, whether we were going to, in fact, have an attack, uh, two, what the scope and magnitude of the attack would be, um, it would be much easier for us to prevent it, but we don't. So uh, the general scenario that I think prudently that we always follow is you assume a, a worst reasonable case scenario and you plan accordingly. Forsman and other state and local leaders spoke with Secretary Ridge in a conference call yesterday afternoon. Some cities were warned of possible attacks as early as the middle of last week. In cities across the country, officials held press conferences describing the steps they're taking to increase security. New York has been at orange alert since the September 11th attacks. Mayor Michael Bloomberg said that his city is increasing security even more, but holiday events will take place as scheduled. We can go about our business as individuals, day in and day out, knowing that we have the world's greatest police department that is doing everything that we can ask them to do, and we think everything that is necessary to keep this a safe place. 
The increased alert comes after a week of warning signs. On Friday, the Arab TV network Al Jazeera aired a tape believed to be of al-Qaeda's second-in-command. The voice on that tape said, We are still chasing the Americans and their allies everywhere, even in their homeland. Secretary Ridge said despite the warnings, Americans should not cancel their holiday plans. He urged people to remain vigilant and said families should put together emergency preparedness kits if they've not done so already. Uh, good morning. Uh, the president uh, uh, convened the Homeland Security Council this morning in wake of the decision to go from uh, yellow to orange or from an elevated risk of terrorist attack uh, to a high risk of terrorist attack. Uh, it was very important uh, to the president uh, uh, to learn and to direct the kind of coordinated activity that has been undertaken since the announcement was made yesterday uh, between the members of his Homeland Security Council. Uh, we're doing a lot of work through Homeland Security with the Department of Defense, uh, the State Department, uh, the Attorney General's Office, and the FBI. And so we reviewed the uh, the specific plans and the specific actions that we've uh, undertaken and will continue to take uh, throughout this period of high alert. Uh, as I said yesterday, when we made the announcement, uh, that was a general announcement to the, our fellow citizens. Uh, it was also a direction and directive, uh, not only to the federal government, uh, but to the state governments and local governments and even to the private sector that based on the threat reporting and the elevation of the level of risk, there were additional measures uh, that they needed to take to add more security uh, so that uh, uh, we can, again, on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week basis, uh, remind and, and, and just assure Americans that government at all levels, working in conjunction with the private sector, is at work protecting their way of life and our freedoms. Uh, clearly, uh, for national security reasons, we're not going to broadcast everything uh, that we're doing. Uh, but uh, whenever we get uh, information that's relevant uh, to a city or a, a potential threat, uh, where appropriate, we share that information. And we have done that in the past and we will continue to do so through this period and as long as uh, we're dealing with the threat of uh, global terrorism. So again, I think it was very important for me to report to you the President's convening of the uh, Homeland Security Council, uh, our review with the President of the specific actions that uh, we've undertaken at the federal level. Uh, operation centers are up uh, across the board, DOD, uh, FBI, Homeland Security. I, I can't uh, possibly under emphasize enough how much uh, the local communities are doing as well. Uh, the big city mayors, uh, big city police chiefs. Frankly, even since 9-11, I think uh, the, their level of readiness and security has been enhanced. Uh, but when we raise the threat level, uh, they add more patrolmen uh, and they pay more attention to critical infrastructure in and around their uh, uh, community. So again, uh, strong message, hopefully of reassurance and confidence uh, to the American public. Uh, the federal government, with our partners at the state and local level, and uh, other security professionals around the country uh, are on the alert, are working 24-7. It, it is the conclusion of the intelligence community, general consensus within that community, that uh, all the strategic indicators suggest uh, from the volume, really the, the level and the amount of reporting has increased. Uh, we've never quite seen it. Uh, at this level before, and the sources we could point to uh, that are credible in our ability to corroborate uh, some of this information. Uh, the strategic indicators suggest that it is the uh, most significant threat reporting uh, since 9-11. When we get information, be it venue-specific, city-specific, we share it and to th with those who can act on it. Thank it's you. Okay, thank you very much. Americans are perfectly willing to do everything necessary to make America safer. But at a time like this, when every American is asked to experience inconvenience and every local city and town is asked to spend enormous sums to avoid another horror like September 11th. Yesterday, Secretary Ridge called on all Americans to prepare to implement their emergency plan. And if they didn't have one, 
because the terrorist threat level is higher now than it has been since September 11 to put one in place. This advice, while necessary, dramatically underlines the mismatch between where we are spending American treasure and lives compared where we expect to be attacked. And the secretary made clear that once again, they sought to use airplanes as a source uh, of their weaponry to be used against the American people. But Americans would like most of all to see the capture of Osama bin Laden and his top lieutenants who are planning attacks against Americans on American soil. These are the enemies in the war on terror who are having a direct effect on the security of every American family. Nevertheless, we are daily pouring the bounty of American wealth and the sacrifice of hundreds of young American lives into the Tigris and Euphrates while significantly underfunding the mission of protecting the Hudson, the Potomac, the Mississippi, or the Charles. I think that America should be on code orange permanently when it comes to uh, ensuring that we screen all cargo that goes on all passenger planes. That is the only way in which we can go back to code yellow uh, on a regular basis. If we have anything less than code orange uh, for the screening of, pass uh, of packages which go onto passenger planes full time, then we should be on code orange full time because that's how easy it would be uh, to uh, place these packages onto passenger planes. Yes. Just over a week ago, the United States government raised the national threat level from an elevated to a high risk of terrorist attack. And as we know, more commonly known, referred to as from code yellow to code orange. Uh, first, let me say that Homeland Security officials at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, continue to work around the clock to protect our country. And so on behalf of the president and the American people and myself, I would first like to say thank you to literally thousands and thousands of dedicated professionals who willingly exchange their holiday plans for some real hard work, all to better guard the safety and security of their fellow citizens. We know, we know from experience that the increased security we implement when we raise the threat level, along with the increased vigilance that occurs, can help disrupt or deter terrorist attacks. And that continues to be the case. I wish that all Americans could have the benefit of seeing firsthand what I have the opportunity to see. And that is the scope of the response undertaken by all segments of law enforcement, public safety, and government at all levels, as they have quickly and effectively ramped up comprehensive protective measures around the entire country. It is because of their good efforts that we are, without doubt, better prepared to deter or to respond to a terrorist threat than ever before. Now, the Department of Homeland Security has been in constant contact with federal, state, and local officials from around the country. Across the nation, federal, state, and local authorities and the private sector have worked quickly to increase police presence and security procedures, to bolster critical infrastructure protection, and activate emergency operation centers on a 24-7 basis. From New York to Los Angeles, from Las Vegas to Houston, Actions have been taken ranging from security personnel, additional security personnel being placed in transit systems, shopping malls, and other places of community gathering. There, there is increased surveillance at critical infrastructure sites, including bridges, power plants, water systems, and nuclear facilities. Law enforcement personnel coordinating with area hotels, convention centers, and arenas to maintain business as usual but also generate, generate heightened awareness of any suspicious situations. 
And let me just add that Homeland Security executive teams made up of members of my staff with wide range of security expertise and capabilities can serve as a resource to cities and states. Let me also underscore that these kinds of security actions are being put in place to better protect you as you prepare for travel, for New Year's Eve celebrations, for bowl games, whatever your plans may be. Now, as you know, last week, the United States and fr the French governments together took steps to halt inbound international flights, acting on specific information we had to ensure the safety of these flights. Based upon advanced information, for example, Air France Flight 68, originating from Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris and destined for Los Angeles International Airport, was not allowed to take off. We engaged in similar cooperative action with the governments of the United Kingdom and Mexico. This is an extraordinary example. I think it's an excellent example of the unprecedented partnership and cooperation that is now underway both here at home, across all segments of government and law enforcement, including with our international allies. We shared information. We shared information with people who could act upon it. And we are grateful that officials in France responded immediately. In fact, just this morning, the several members of this administration met with a French delegation. And today's meeting is an indication of the importance our mutual governments place on security, as well as the need to work together to protect the public from the threat of terrorism. We had a productive discussion on a variety of areas of mutual concern, including intelligence and information sharing, specific measures to strengthen aviation security, and other security efforts that we have underway. We also agreed that members of our teams will meet again in January to continue to reassess our progress and advance our shared goals to combat terrorism. Today I am announcing the Department of Homeland Security has issued aviation emergency amendments to further enhance security relating to both passenger and cargo aircraft flying to, flying from, and over the United States. Specifically, we have requested that international air carriers, where necessary, place trained, armed government law enforcement officers on designated flights as an added protective measure. These directives, effective immediately, are part of our ongoing effort to make air travel safe for Americans and visitors alike. All Americans should know, now that we are at a code orange state of alert, additional meaningful security measures have been put in place all across the country. And these measures, now they're both visible and invisible to visitors and travelers, are blanketing airports, seaports, chemical and nuclear sites, gathering places all across America and with unparalleled protection. I also want to remind all Americans that we continue under an orange alert, that as we continue under an orange alert, the awareness and preparedness of individual citizens is critical to the ultimate security of this nation as well. Reporting any suspicious activity you may see helps security officials help you and your fellow citizens. Additionally, and you've heard me say this many times before, simple steps that individuals can take, such as preparing a family emergency plan, putting together an emergency supply kit or communication plan, simply staying informed. These all can go a long way toward making us more secure and better prepared. In the end, each of us must remember that we are at war, at war against an enemy driven by hate, and determined to destroy the ideals we cherish and the way of life we hold dear. For them, victory is gained if we give in to terror or panic that they seek to create with their threats. So I encourage all Americans to go forward with their holiday plans, gather with family and friends, reach out to your neighbors, reach, root for your favorite football team, and rest assured that the full force of Homeland Security all across this nation is at work 
to keep you safe. Thank you. Yes? How exactly can you um, require foreign governments to put armed law enforcement officers on their, on the planes? And how can you be sure that these, that they actually have any system in place to train people to do that? And how will, who will bear the cost of all this? And well, first of all, um, any sovereign government retains the right to revoke the privilege of flying uh, to and from a country or even over their airspace. So uh, ultimately the denial of access is uh, the leverage that you have. But I must say that uh, with the spirit of cooperation evidenced uh, by our discussions with French and British officials and the like, it's pretty clear that it is understood by our international aviation partners that uh, the threat to passenger aircraft is an international challenge and all of us must uh, work as closely together as possible to share information and act upon it to ensure the safety of our citizens uh, uh, wherever that flight might originate or whatever its ultimate destination is. Wait, yes? Wait, with the second part of that, how can you be sure that they'll actually have people trained or have a program to train law enforcement officers? To well, we have uh, first of all, uh, we've made, uh, I think, very appropriate uh, overtures in, a, in an organized effort to have these discussions with foreign governments and from law enforcement to law enforcement, dip diplomat to diplomat. And we also have uh, DHS inspectors who can and would be working with uh, our aviation partners internationally to ensure that the kinds of protective measures we have requested actually were effective. Yes, sir, you yes. say where necessary you would require law enforcement yes. officers. Can you give me some examples of where that would be necessary? There would be, uh, there have been times and will be times, I'm sure, where uh, information that is generated by uh, the intelligence community could be domestic or foreign. Again, we've got many global partners, many friends that are gathering information uh, about terrorists and terrorist plans uh, that we believe shared with the appropriate country and the appropriate airline uh, might require a, an added level of protection, an added level uh, layer of safety to include trained, armed government law enforcement officials. Again, it would be driven by information that we shared and then it was acted upon. Sorry, with yes. all of these steps taken for security, um, with the orange alert coming during during the holidays, mm -hmm. now these extra official uh, extra um, security on airlines. How, is there any guess, guess at how much this is costing, <coughs> or how much this is going to cost the economy and the government? Well, uh, hopefully the uh, the signs that we've seen over the past several days. Uh, that people continue to travel, hopefully with a greater sense of confidence. When we raise the level to orange uh, to alert the public generally, that was also a signal to airports and to law enforcement and to a wide range of uh, security professionals that we had to raise the level of security as well. So we haven't seen, I believe, uh, any any reduction in air travel. I just happened to uh, take uh, someone very close to me to an airport uh, uh, today and uh, Reagan was packed. So it seems to me that again we would like to think that uh, because uh, we've had these layers of security to uh, passenger travel, and remember this is just another and a long list of measures that we've taken over the past two and a half years to improve uh, air safety. Mr. Sorry. Secretary, on the case of the uh, international cooperation for the safety of the planes, uh, what response have you get from the Mexican authorities? And uh, if you talk to Secretary Creel, what he said about the putting uh, armed guards on the planes from Mexico to the U.S.? Well, let me uh, tell you that the last time we had to uh, we raised our alert level internally to orange. The Mexican government uh, directed literally thousands and thousands of their law enforcement personnel to assist us in protecting American interests and American citizens in Mexico. Uh, the response this time with regard to improving uh, passenger safety or air safety was similar. Uh, very, very aggressive action undertaken by the Mexican government in response to our request to improve security. 
Uh, again, I, again, as a neighbor and a partner, that's not the first time we've asked them to help us, and in doing so, help themselves. Again, uh, this is an international challenge that we all have, and again, information generated from one source or another, shared with uh, one country or another uh, to affect and improve uh, aviation security is something that I believe the world community has adjusted to. Yes. 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 to concerns that the color-coded uh, threat levels just are too vague and really difficult to respond to and calls by some in Congress to try to make these alerts much more targeted and really much easier for people to understand and, and, and respond to? Well, I've, I've uh, engaged, begun to engage with the members of Congress with regard to refining the Homeland Security Advisory System. First of all, let me say that uh, it's a good system. Okay. It's a far, far better system than the one we initially employed when uh, either the Attorney General or the FBI Director or, or uh, I came out on stage and said uh, the threats uh, require us to go to Orange and leave it at that or just give a general alert even before we had the system. Now when we make an announcement, we know that uh, accompanying action is taken across the board. Uh, we will continue to work with our colleagues in Congress. We're interested in improving and refining the system, and uh, we, we look forward to those conversations. Is but you do goal? need... I'm sorry? Do you anticipate actual changes happening in 2004? Again, the system has been designed to give us the kind of flexibility uh, that we need to target the alert if the information warrants that it be targeted. Under uh, it's our best judgment, under the existing circumstances as we know them, it was more appropriate to go national with the alert rather than regional or community specific. But it, there's a design feature in there, but it's still based upon information that we have. But we'll continue to work with the uh, the Congress to see if we can refine it. Secretary. Yes. Secretary, can you tell us with respect to the announcement today about uh, trained air marshals on other nations' flights, was there an intelligence-based reason for issuing this today? Was there specific intelligence that caused you to put out these amendments today? Oh, no, no. This, this has been part of an organized uh, effort that we have, we've undertaken. We've had some private conversations with individual governments and the decision was made uh, working with the Department of State and other agencies of the federal government just to put the amendment out today basically notice uh, to uh, all countries uh, that have international flights uh, that uh, travel either to from or over the United States that there may be occasions in the future when we have to have the same kinds of conversations that we've recently had with the French with regard to uh, air travel and to give them uh, an alert, give them an idea that we may ask them to provide this additional measure of security depending on the specific information that leads us to have the conversation in the first place. Do yes. you have any evidence that any of these actions so far have thwarted a terrorist plot of any kind? We had... Uh, specific information that we needed to be acted upon relative to the Air France flights. The law enforcement community in France is uh, sharing the results of those uh, uh, interviews uh, with the, the passengers that were on the one flight and since we still continue our investigation relative to the information uh, that information, related information, I just don't think it would be appropriate for me to Mr. comment on that. Yes. How long do you expect the uh, Code Orange to be in effect through January? The, uh, well, at last, at least uh, through the holiday season and perhaps beyond, it is very difficult to uh, give you a date certain. It is intelligence driven, and when there's a similar consensus within the intelligence community and the President's Homeland Security. Uh, advisory council that we uh, lower the level we will but you can Secretary. well anticipate it'll be through the new year's at least Mr. yes Secretary. is there a goal to uh, eventually have air marshals on all international flights in and out of this country no the goal is to have uh, the present goal is to have uh, armed and trained law enforcement officials on flights of interest where uh, the information warrants that added level of protection. Secretary Rich, you said that we should not give in to terrorists and we should go about our lives as normal. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't the cancellation of six flights right before Christmas, stranding probably hundreds if not thousands of people, <coughs> 
be giving in to terrorists, was there no other way to deal with that threat than to cancel those flights? I think within, within, your, uh, within your question is the answer. There's always a range of alternatives to deal with a threat. And in, these, in this situation, given the nature of the information uh, that was uh, in the French government's, uh, from the French government's point of view, the best way to deal with it, and we agreed with their decision. Mr. Secretary, as, as you, it, with the passing of Christmas, are you as concerned about, a, about an attack, a possible attack, this week as you were last week? I would say that the decision to raise the uh, uh, threat level was based upon information that indicated to us that the threat level would be sustained over a period of uh, several weeks. So the answer is yes. Uh, we are as concerned today as we were yesterday. We'll be concerned as much this week as we were last week. All right. Thank you. Thanks, all.